Praise the Lord, a very special good day, good evening, good morning to you, and welcome to our Sunday School Hour on a Thursday night. We are so excited to be hosting this series on the things which must be hereafter. What an exciting journey it has been for us to take a look into the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ as he unwraps the scriptures and gives us a look into the things which must happen afterwards. We talked about heaven, we talked about the rapture, we talked about the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, the Millennium, and we talk about the heavenly city, we talk about the doctrine of last things, we talk about hell, and it was such an interesting journey. The last Bible school, or last Sunday school, we uh, took a peek into heavenly worship and see what it's like to be worshiping in heaven. What an interesting experience that was. You know, I was asked many times about what we will be like in heaven, what our bodies will be like, what about our families, what about our friends? And um, the Bible is not silent about that, so I'm happy to take you on a journey so we can find that answer in the scripture. So be happy if you can bow your hearts with me and let us pray today. Gracious God and Father, we sincerely thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. We come again at your throne and before you to unwrap your scriptures and to take a look into what you have revealed to us about the things which must be hereafter. As we come into the study, I ask you to bless our thoughts and our understanding that we can be able to comprehend with all the saints what is contained in your golden pages. Thank you for all those that are studying with us today, and I pray that you will bless them and touch their minds and their understandings. I ask these and more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. I know we have friends literally all over the world, all over the country. I'm glad you decide to spend this hour with us as we examine this important question, what will our bodies be like in heaven? I remember reading about this great evangelical preacher of a time gone by. His name is D.L. Moody. Dr. D.L. Moody, on his dying bed, he said these words. He said, you will hear in a few days that D.L. Moody is dead, but don't believe a word of it because he's very much alive. In fact, he's more alive than he has ever been. Well, you know, he died a few days after, but what he was really trying to say is, after I die, by the time you get the news that I die, I would have been alive with my Savior in heaven and enjoying my new life with my new body. And that is the thought and the message he was trying to convey. So let us look into the scriptures and find out exactly what our new bodies will be like. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to see an infomercial or a commercial on TV where people are advertising different types of workout sessions and different types of diets and nutrition uh, where they can give you a body that is unlike the one you have if you follow their instructions. And they name it bodies by so-and-so. They give a name to that. Um, I don't want to tell you the names of the many people who are advertising this online right now. But I do want to say that, you know, I'm presenting to you today bodies by Jesus. Bodies by Jesus. Bodies that are designed and created by the Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever program you're on now, you can kind of put that aside. And let us do the bodies by Jesus. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 38, Paul is talking about the seed as the seed goes into the ground and it, di and it dies. And I just want to read a small part of that verse where it says, God gives it, talking about the seed, a body as he pleases. God decides that he's going to give the seed a body, a different body that is full of life. A seed that goes into the ground and dies suddenly becomes something different. So, 
that is the premise from which I would like to establish this discourse today. And that is that God is the one who gives that body. That new body I'm talking about is given to us by God himself. Now, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul is talking a little bit about life in this world after we have experienced salvation. This is not the afterlife now. This is today as a Christian. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The new, new, the new King James translation says, He is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let's take a look at that same text with the New Life version. New Life version says, if a man belongs to Christ, he is a new person. The old life is gone. New life has begun. I like that version. You know, whenever you are transfigured or you have given your life to Christ, now you are a new person. You are a new person. Uh, I, the New International Version has an interesting take on that same scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old one or the old has gone, the new is here. So what this text is simply saying is that at the moment that we become saved with the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Lord gives us a new nature. He gives us new desires. We are new in so many ways. Even though we have our old body, but at that moment in time, we are referred to as the new man, as the new man, because our ambition is new, our desires are new, our goals are new. We think new. We do things that we never did before or don't do before, and we act in new ways. So the same way that happens to us in life as Christians, let us try to stretch that a little bigger, a little wider, to see that God is not only going to give us a new nature on this earth. He's going to give us a brand new body, completely made over, altogether made over. And, and the scripture kind of shows us how that happens here in the text. In, uh, in, in the same book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians, it says here, But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Oh, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. And that reference really is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, sorry, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. Paul is saying, you know, he's kind of chiding with the Corinthian church. And he's saying, listen, man, you, this new life, this new person cannot be resurrected until this person dies. One of the most important qualifications for a resurrected person is that they must die. The person has to die first in order for them to be resurrected. So in, in trying to explain that, he uses the analogy of a seed. If a seed is going to produce a new plant, which is brand new and green and full of life, that seed has to first of all die in the ground. It is sown in corruption, he says. It means the seed literally goes into the ground and dies. And it is after the death of the seed, then it is raised up into something new and beautiful and useful. And that's the same concept he's using here. In John 12 and verse 24, uh, you know, the old man must die before the new man is resurrected. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So here the Lord is really confirming this. So it is after the death of the seed that the, the tree is produced or comes alive with life. And that's how it is in the word. In verse 37 of 37, 8 of Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, And what you sow 
you do not sow that body that shall be. You know, what we sow, we're not sowing the body that is going to be, but merely grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But look at verse 38. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. That's why I'm calling this bodies by God and bodies by Jesus. So this seed, this dry seed that goes into the ground and dies, that is not what comes up. <laughs> Something different comes up, altogether different, after it dies. So therefore, here is what Paul is really saying. This body that you see, our body, our flesh and blood, will not be the body that goes to heaven. It is something completely different. Imagine the difference between a dry grain of corn and a beautiful, delicious kernel of corn. It's that different. It's very, very different. There are many similarities, but the difference is noticeable and huge. So in our discourse today, we're going to talk about four things. We'll talk about our new bodies will be indestructible. We're going to make a comparison between the old and the new. And the first thing we're saying is that our new bodies will be indestructible. Our new bodies will be identifiable. Our new bodies will be incredible. And our new bodies will definitely be infinite. It will last forever. And let us examine the scriptures and see how God outlines this for us. In 1 Corinthians 15, that's the chapter we are really studying today. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Very, very great comparison, very interesting comparison. You know, when someone dies and they're placed into the ground, we call that, the corruption of the body. The body has lost life, has lost consciousness. It is about to decay or sometimes already started to decay. So it goes into the ground completely helpless, completely useless to the person anymore. You can't use that body anymore. But Paul is saying just as the dry seed goes into the ground and dies and raises up to be a green, healthy plant to produce life, so will our bodies be. Our body that will die and go to the ground and seek corruption. Corruption means decay. It will begin to decay. Then so will our bodies be. And then God will raise up that same body that saw corruption to a glorious body. And just the thought of that is completely, Completely, completely amazing. Now, I must tell you that there was one person who lived on this earth that did not experience that. And he was the only one that did not experience that. And for that, we look into the book of Psalms, Psalms 16 and verse 10. Here's what that says. The psalmist writing, he says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol or hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So Jesus came with a promise from the Father that his body will not decay. That's the reason why he had to be resurrected on the third day. Because after the third day, then the body begins to suffer decay. decay. It begins to be corrupt. So the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. The body that God gave him never saw corruption. And there was no need for it. He remained perfect, even in his death. He was literally resurrected and changed from his natural perfect body to his glorious body. That's the reason. That's the only one in the world who we know did not, did not see that at their death. Now, what will our new bodies be like? Our new bodies will be indestructible. It, it will be indestructible. It means our bodies cannot be destroyed. And there are a few things I want us to consider. Number one, our bodies, our new bodies will know no pain. It will know no peril, no decay, no death for sure, no fatigue. It's a different type of body than the ones we have today. And if you have ever worked really hard in a long day's work and felt, you know, the pangs of fatigue, 
you know how really exciting it is to know that you're going to receive a body that will never get tired. Never, ever get tired. What a promise. Our bodies will live on forever. It will outlive the stars. It will live on forever and ever and ever and ever. And that is really, really something very exciting. So we, first of all, we know that our bodies will be indestructible. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be killed. And our bodies will be identifiable. The next thing you want to look at. Our bodies will be identifiable. You will be able to identify your friends and your relatives and your loved ones when you go to heaven. You will know everyone, even if you did not know them on the earth. Because God will give us complete knowledge where we will know each other. We will know everyone. And your memory and your knowledge will be complete. It's perfect. Your brain will be complete. Your understanding of things will be complete. Here's what Paul tells us in verse 43. He says, it, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. He's talking about the same seed. And the difference between what is sown and what comes up, he said the body is the same thing. The body is sown in dishonor. In dishonor. When you put that body down into the grave, you know, it's, it is sown. Burying someone is like planting a seed. That will grow again one day. That's the analogy. And that's the reason. When you literally place someone in the earth, you are planting a seed that Paul says God will cause to germinate and bloom into a very different, different body than what was placed into the ground. Uh, and the word raised in glory, raised in glory, glory. The original word means brilliance. Brilliance like bright and shiny. And some folks believe that maybe our bodies will be brilliant. I don't know. But the scripture says we will be raised in glory. We will be brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant by the way you think and brilliant by the way you look. So that is something really to look forward to. Uh, our bodies will be identifiable. We'll be able to know. Uh, in 1 John 3 and verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Think of that for a minute. You know, the scripture is telling us here that we shall see him as he is. We will, we will not only see him as he is, but we shall be like him. Now, if the disciples were able to identify Jesus after his resurrection, it means, therefore, that we will be able to identify each other. That's simply what it means, because we know we are going to be like Jesus. And if Jesus knew his disciples after his resurrection, we will also know each other after we are raised. You see? It's very easy for us to get a picture of what we are going to be like because we know what Jesus was like after he rose from the dead. And that is so amazing. Now, our bodies will be identifiable in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So, you know, here is, the, here is the thing. When God created man and placed him on the earth, we now became the image of God. The image of God. And Christ is God the Son. So we were made in his image. We were made in his, his image. If, you know, we don't know exactly what God looked like, but we know if we are able to see him, his features will be close to the features of a man. That means he's not going to look like one of the other animals or one of the other creatures of this world. His features will be quite close to that of a man. The anthropomorphic expressions literally deals with how God compares to man in features or in traits. Like we talk about the hand of God, the eyes of God, the feet of God, the mouth of God, the heart of God. You know, those terms are being used in Scripture and in theology 
to tell us that we are really made in the image of God. So we will also bear the image of the heavenly man. So exactly what Christ looks like now is what we are going to look like when we get to heaven. And if you want a good place to say amen, that's a good place right there. Our bodies will be identifiable. Will, will people know us? Of course, yes. Here's my theory. So if our bodies will be identifiable and be like the body of Jesus, then what was the body of Jesus like? So let us examine this theory. What was the body of Jesus like? His body was real. His body was like that of the first man, like Adam. And his body was touchable. And when I say his body was like that of the first man, it was not in its entirety, only in a few aspects. And, the, and I'll come to that as we go along. Now, his body was real. Luke 24 and verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So this, you know, this scripture tells of a story when Thomas, Thomas wanted to doubt the disciples and to say, you know, I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what he said. He said, I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And unless I see him, I will not believe. So the disciples told him, said, yes, the Lord rose from the dead. A week after, Jesus is there with them. The door is being shut. And here comes Thomas is with them, sorry. The door is being shut. And Jesus comes in, in their midst. And Jesus says to him, look, man, handle me and see. Touch me. See that I have flesh and bones. The disciples at one time did not believe it was him as well. The disciples did not believe it was him. And they, uh, they questioned it. They were really worried. And they were really sad. And they were really uh, frightened to know if it was really Jesus. But Jesus, uh, Jesus said to them, listen, come and touch me. Handle me. See that it is I. I am the one who uh, is here, the same one who was before. And you can see that for yourself. So he said, behold my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So Jesus is not going to be a spirit body. And uh, when you see a spirit body, that's, that's kind of an oxymoron. A spiritual body is different from a spirit body. A spirit, they kind of, there's not, there is no such thing like a spirit body. Either you're a body or you are a spirit. You can be spiritual, but not spirit and body at the same time. So Jesus is saying, you know, I've got flesh, I've got bones, you can handle me and see. Uh, he didn't, it was interesting here, he didn't say blood. I wonder why he didn't say blood. I got flesh and bones. Do you think it's possible that he has already given all of his blood? That's why he didn't have any. And uh, just the thought of that, it's quite interesting to examine. Maybe it's the fact that the nails that were driven in his feet and his hands and his side and him hanging on the cross for six long hours stayed there enough time for all of the blood to drain out of his body. He's given his life for you and I so that you and I can have a body just like him. What a concept. It was a real body. Luke 24, verse 42 to 33, it says, So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. So, you know, Jesus says that if you don't believe I'm real, give me something to eat. So it is a body that can eat. And I know this question has been asked over and over and over again. Pastor, uh, will, we, will we eat in heaven? And here's your answer right here. Yes, we will eat. And not like you eat on earth. Oh, man, it's very different. It's so different. Can you imagine eating and not gaining weight? <laughs> Can you imagine eating? You know, I, this, no more will you say this phrase that you say today. Have you heard this phrase before? 
a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, no more will they say those words. For you will eat for enjoyment, for pleasure. You will eat because it gives you pleasure. And many of you are doing that right now. But you will do it in earnest when you go to heaven. No guilt. Just because you enjoy doing it. All right? His body was real. His body was real. He ate, not once, but many times. In, first, in the book of John, chapter 21, verses 12 and 13, Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? <laughs> Knowing that it was the Lord. You see, that, that's one thing. They knew it was the Lord. The same way they knew it was Jesus is the same way folks will know it is you. And you will know. Who are the other people around you? So look at verse 30. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish, and did eat in their presence. So Jesus ate breakfast and ate dinner. Isn't it amazing to know that the same food they had for dinner is the same food they had for breakfast? <laughs> fish and bread? Fish and bread for dinner and fish and bread for breakfast. But Jesus ate more than one time after his resurrection. So we know that spirits can't do those things. Spirit cannot eat. So our bodies will not just be spirit. It will be a spiritual body, but not a spirit body. Now, the number B, point B, says his body was like the first man. It is like the first man in the context that it is made to live forever, or it is here to live forever. And I don't necessarily believe that anyone made the body that Jesus had, but the body that Jesus had is just a transition of the body he had before on earth, and that's a transition of the body he had before in heaven. So there was no corruption in between. That body did not die and decay, and God gave him a new body. It is just Jesus going through the phases of from one to the other to the other, remain, keeping his deity and his dignity and his power and his authority throughout the passing of time. And that's an amazing thing to even think about. So he would be like... Adam. In fact, he was referred to as the first Adam. And I believe when God made Adam, Adam was made to live forever. And in that sense, Jesus will be living forever, and so will we, except the fact that Jesus was not made or created at any time. So, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And he's only talking about the image here, not about the actual cellular makeup of that structure. Okay. See, the, sec the, the third point of how was Jesus? His body was touchable. You know, he, it was possible for someone to touch Jesus because he was a body. He was not a spirit that would literally vanish in the wind. In John 20 and verse 27, then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. So here is where he had the encounter with Thomas in, in the 27th chapter of the book of John. When he told Thomas, come on, Thomas. I'm not a spirit. You can touch me with your hands. You can hold my hands. You can put your hand into my side. You can put your finger into my hands, into the nail prints. And uh, what, a, what an exciting thing. So it, w what we also recognize is that Jesus kept those nail prints after his resurrection. I think it was possible for him in his resurrected body to decide what he wants and what he does not want. And he could have definitely erased those nail prints. But the songwriter says, the nail prints are the only man-made objects in heaven. 
And Jesus has decided to keep them. He decided to keep them with him. And he's carrying them all through heaven. Isn't that amazing? You can pause for a minute to think that Jesus is keeping the scars. Think of what you will do or what you would want to do if you have a scar on your hand or on your face. You know, you will try your best to get rid of it. Many people spend lots of money trying to get rid of the scars that they may acquire on earth. But Jesus, by his own design, decided to keep those scars and they will be with him forever. We will know him, the songwriter says, by the nail prints in his hands. And if you think of that for a minute, I think it gives us a deeper, stronger appreciation for what Christ did for us and his love for us. And it also gives us a deeper love for him. And if you want a good place to say amen, thank you, Jesus, I think here is the place right now. So he will have those nail scars in his hand. In, in John 20, verse 17, he, Mary tried to hold him back. Look, here's what the verse says. Jesus said to her, speaking to Mary, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and your God. So it was possible for you to hold on to him. But he said, Mary, no, not, not now. You know, I, I'm going to the father when I come back or at a later time, you can probably do that. She was absolutely very happy to see him. Because our bodies will be like Jesus, and Jesus will be recognizable, so our bodies will be recognizable. We will all know each other. That is the finding of these verses. Jesus' body will be recognizable. Our bodies will be like him and like his, so we will also be recognizable. You will know each other when you go to heaven. So let's continue looking, about, looking at this discussion, our bodies by Jesus. First of all, we, we said our bodies will be indestructible, cannot be destroyed. Our bodies, secondly, will be identifiable. You will be able to know each other and know Jesus. And thirdly, our new bodies will be incredible. It will be amazing. It is out of this world. Look, look at what the Bible tells us here in 1 Corinthians 15 and the last part of verse 43. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So this body suddenly transforms from weakness to undescribable power. Indescribable power. Power beyond our very imaginations. You know, it, it, it's such a great contrast between the old body and the new body. The, new, the old body goes down into the grave like a dry seed planted that has died. And then it is resurrected in brilliance and power and authority that it can pass through walls. It can appear and disappear. It can just travel by thought, by the speed of thought. What an incredible body that will be. Uh, well, let's look at what the scripture says in John 20 and verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. Shalom, he said. The disciples are huddled in a room on Sunday evening, the day of his resurrection. And they were scared because they, knew, they, they are fully aware of what the Jews did to Jesus. And if they have an opportunity to do it to them, they will definitely try to silence the movement of Christianity. So they were very, very scared. And in their moment of fear, Jesus came in, even though they closed the door. And I, I'm sure that door was bolted and locked real good if they were afraid. But you don't need an open door to get in the room. With this new body, you can pass through walls. You can travel by thought. You think and you're there. You know, I was thinking about this and I, you know, I said, you know, it's, uh, it's probably the first time some folks will be able to show up on time. But then, you know, <laughs> the Lord reminded me that in that world, there will be no time. <laughs> so can you imagine just thinking and you're there, just using your thoughts 
and you travel just by mere thinking at the speed of a thought, you are there. What an incredible body it will be. And you know what's the best thing of, the best thing of all is that this body will be forever. It's never going to die. It's never going to die at all. Jesus went through walls. He appeared and disappeared. He floated up into heaven on a cloud, and he was glorified. He had a glorified body. Our bodies will be incredible. John chapter 20 and verse 19. We read that. Now, let's recap quickly. Our bodies will be indestructible. Our bodies will be identifiable. Our bodies will be incredible. And finally, our bodies will be infinite. I mean, to know that you have a body like this, I think the best thought of all is to know that this glorious, indestructible, powerful, mighty body that looks like the body of Jesus will never, ever die. It will live on forever. We are always going to keep this body. I think that is really, really very exciting. That, you know, you know if you've ever had to attend the funeral of someone you love and to feel the pain that comes with losing someone and knowing that you may never that you will never ever see that person here on this earth again and you know the sorrow that comes with just the thought of losing that person's companionship uh, it's it's intense but isn't it amazing to know that the bodies that we are going to have will never ever go through that death will be thrown into the lake of fire the bible says Death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. It will be done away with forever, forever and forever and forever. Our bodies will be infinite. And here's how that's going to happen. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. So this body that we have is not the body that can live forever. It has to be a changed body. So after it goes through the process of change, in verse 52, it says, It's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed so we shall be changed and we shall be changed from our earthly body to his glorious body what an exciting thing that is in first thessalonians 4 and verse 16 it says for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And he continues that verse by saying in verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Paul is saying, but all of this has to happen before our bodies go through a process of change. It is after we change, that's the time when the changed body will be infinite and will never die. It will live forever and ever and ever. What a, what a powerful thought. What a great consolation. And then Paul says in the next verse, he says, verse 18, Therefore, Comfort one another with these words. He says, comfort one another. After we have discovered the fact that this new body God is going to give us will be indestructible, it will be identifiable, it will be like Jesus, and it will be recognizable, it will also be infinite. It will go on forever. Oh, man, that's so good. It, it, no more death. No more funerals. No more saying goodbye to our loved ones. We are having this glorious body, and this glorious body will be on forever and ever and ever, never to be diminished, never to get tired, never to be weak, never to be fatigued, never to be frustrated, never to be hungry, never to die. What a promise. What a possibility. What a God. And this is not something that we need to stretch our imaginations to kind of conceive because we have an example of someone who had a body like this, who walked on the earth. And even secular historians, like Josephus, Flavius Josephus says 
that Jesus, who was more than a prophet, was crucified, rose on the third day, and appeared unto many of his followers, some of whom are still alive today. Those are the words of Flavius Josephus, a secular historian writing in the first century. So it is an established fact that Jesus lived, died, rose again, and he demonstrated the characteristics of his body to those who were around. They saw it, they experienced him, they knew what he was like. And the Bible tells us here that we are going to be just like him. You know, I want to close here tonight, today, with this one thought. As exciting and as promising as this is, and as factual as this is, I do want to say to you that we are not going to have this body if we miss the resurrection. And if we do not accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. You know, this is a body that is going to be like his body, that is going to be a place that can accommodate his body, and it is a body that is going to be transferred into heaven by Jesus. So you cannot be on that trip with that body unless you first accept him as your personal savior. I want to share with you this one fact as we close, that this body we have now was designed and is suited for life on this earth. That's why we can live on this earth. This new body is designed and suited for life, life on the new earth and in the new heaven. So God is giving us a new body, preparing us for a new home, in a new arena, in a new sphere of life that will continue forever and forever and forever. I want to give you an opportunity right now to be on that trip to be a part of that new gathering of the congregation, the general assembly of the firstborn. And if you would accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior today, I want to assure you that he will give you a new body. He will give you a new life. You've got to accept him as your personal savior. You've got to ask him to forgive you. You've got to ask him to cleanse you of all the things that you did before. And you have to. You really have to. It is absolutely necessary for you to invite Jesus into your heart. Would you bow your hearts right now as I give you the opportunity to do that? If you would like to do that, would you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you today for revealing your word to me and showing me in your word what a glorious body you are preparing for me. I thank you for the body I have now, but this body was riddled with pain and death and suffering. And I know one day it will go down into the earth like a dry corn planted. And I know one day that if I accept you, you will cause this old body to be resurrected in glory. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Please have mercy upon me. Please wash my sins away so I can be a part of that new heavenly place, that new heavenly body that lives forever and forever and forever. I want to be a part of that life, O oh Lord, and I beg you to help me today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying that prayer. I would also like to encourage you today and give you an opportunity to give, if you are so inclined to do, that you will give via our cash app or via our PayPal. These are the two mediums that we encourage our folks to give during this time of crisis. And I encourage all Christians everywhere um, to share in the blessing of giving. I know that many of us are not able to be at church and to give in the usual way, but I do want to take this time out to encourage you that it is absolutely important that you give during this time. God bless you and thank you for your giving. Amen. Blessed be your name, O Lord. We give you thanks. We praise you. We glorify you. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on the happy golden shore. What a day that will be. There will be no sorrow there. No more burdens to share. 
No more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be the one with the one who died for me. What a glorious day that will be. Brothers and sisters, welcome to Sunday School on a Thursday. I am Newton Lennon, your host, and I have with me Dr. Oliver Sabran, who has taught us, who has brought us yet again and given us a guided tour into heaven. We want to say thank you. We want to say thank you, Pastor, for having us in heaven for such a long time. And we hope to stay there for a long, 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 long time. And uh, let me just say that tonight's broadcast is pre-recorded, so we will not be able to take your questions live. However, we will answer your questions next Tuesday, when we, which will be our new day for our new afternoon for Sunday school. It will not be Sunday school on a Thursday anymore, but Sunday school on a Tuesday. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for everything. And please worship with us as we go into this section, the question and answer section. Pastor, let's get some things out of the way. Let's, heaven is not the ether real existence where spirits flow and uh, there's a term called duppy and goats and all of that thing because th this, this, this is, sounds pretty ethereal. Is heaven real? Is it a place? I, I, I would like you to go into that and let us be more confident because this is great. I cannot see anyone who would hear of this and not want to be there. What would stop anyone from being in such a real place? Well, thank you. Thank you, Roland. I appreciate the opportunity of being here as well. Uh, there's so many examples in Scripture to tell us about the reality of heaven and the fact that it's a real place. There are words used in Scripture to define heaven, um, about the throne of God. There is a throne there. there. There is a physical throne that looks like a jasper, like a diamond with an emerald, and it's like ruby, and it has a rainbow around it, and someone is sitting on that throne from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away. And we talk about a river that flows from that throne, and we talk about the tree of life, which literally are trees of life, because the Bible, the Revelation says, each tree produces a different fruit each month and the leaves of that tree is for the healing of the nation. So we believe is, it, it, these are physical things. And what made it even more physical is that when the angel took John up onto the Mount of God and showed him the city, the city called heaven that was built prefab, it's a prefabricated, prefabricated city made in heaven. So somewhere in the vastness of heaven, God has set aside a little corner, and you got to go over a mountain to see that, it seems like. And then when you go on the mountain, then that's when you see this city. Um, it, it means that this mountain is probably very high. If the city itself is 1,500 miles high and 1,500 miles wide, and you don't see it until you go on this mountain. So think of the vastness of this. John took a reed or a measuring rod and he measured the city, he and this angel did. So these are not something born in the fragment of someone's imagination. It is something that is real. He was not the only one, but because Moses also was caught up and saw the tabernacle, he saw the altar, he saw the lamp that burns before the throne of God, the, the, the lamp that burns before God's throne. And he wrote about all of these things. In fact, he built the tabernacle after the pattern of what he saw in heaven. So he literally saw something up there and came and built it down here. And there are so many other, so many other uh, types of inscription given to show us that this is a real place. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. But just before we delve into our uh, discussion a little more, let's get some more ethereal things out of the way. If heaven is a place somewhere high up, can, can, we, can we take a, a spacecraft and go up and take a peep to see where it is? Is it possible that man in its existence in our real forward thinking scientific term can, can see 
even where it is and take a far look with a telescope or something like that? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I would have to think the answer to that is no, <laughs> because there is only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus, you know. And you would need a body that can travel at the speed of thought rather than travel at the speed of light. And let me tell you why. Because we know that some of the stars we can see are many light years away. And it means you have to travel at the speed of light and take several years to get to it. So I don't think we have, this, we have uh, developed any spacecraft that has an engine that travels at the speed of light as yet. And uh, if we do, it will take many, 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 many years to get to the nearest star. And heaven is beyond the stars, not the nearest star. It's beyond the stars of God. So you've got to pass all the stars. And when you pass all the stars, then... I don't know how far it is past the last star, but I kind of <laughs> like to suspect that. It may be a question <laughs> for mathematicians. I, I, I kind of suspect that that will be an exercise in futility. Because the formula you would use to get that is the 10 minus 3 base and, and, and 10 minus 43, um, which is going to take us into some deep physics and some deep math. So let's not try and go there because <laughs> the, th the people who are building the Tower of Babel, they, they didn't get far. Right. Um, we haven't been to the moon a lot. We have not yet built, and, and, and just to say that, we, I want us to, because time is going to run away from us fast, and, and this is deep thought. This is real, sto real stuff that we, we're looking into. It's documented, um, and we want to ask this question. When we die as Christians, when will we get our glorified body? Is it immediately after we die? Or when Christ will come again and we are risen and gone up to heaven? I think, uh, I think we have uh, sort of an intermediate body. Uh, our spirit and our soul goes up to God after death. And then we are waiting for the resurrection at that time. But if you look at what Paul says in, in the New Testament, Paul says when Jesus comes back, when Jesus comes back and the rapture, the dead in Christ will be raised first. So at that time is when I believe that those who die in the Lord now and have transitioned to heaven in their spirit and their soul will be reunited with their bodies that has been placed in the earth. When a person dies, their body goes to the earth. But at the resurrection and at the rapture, then they will be reunited with that body that died, even if they were thrown into the sea because the scripture tells us that the sea give up the dead. So God is going to recreate these bodies just like a, a seed that goes into the ground and dies and a, a, a new plant comes up, brand new. That God is going to do that. So we'll have a new bodies then, then at the resurrection, at the rapture. At the rapture. Right. And there's going to be a resurrection afterwards too. The rest of the dead live not until the thousand years are over. So th those who die outside of Christ are not going to be resurrected until after the millennium. After the thousand years. Yes. Jesus' physical body went up into heaven. Uh, am I right on that line? Yes. Our bodies will not go until after the, if we're die, dead, until after the millennium. Our bodies will be going to heaven at the rapture. At the rapture. Yes, because Paul says the dead in Christ shall rise first. This corruptible, he says, Paul says this corruptible we'll will put, put on incorruption. incorruption. That's when that happens. And this mortal will have put on immortality. Yes, and uh, as we, we move on in that, uh, I want to make some separation here. 
to, to make a distinction between the spirit and the body. Because when we die, the spirit will go to heaven. Yes. Right away. But the body will not. Body goes to the ground. Goes to the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So therefore, that's the spirit will go to heaven if we're going to heaven. Yeah. The spirit for those who are not going to go to heaven, what will happen? Will well, the spirit who are not going to heaven are going to hell. And they will go like immediately when they die. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. remember now, Jesus talked about Lazarus and he said when Lazarus died, he was taken by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And that's where that theory came about. Remember, I remember you did ask me a question as to when someone goes to heaven, if they have to be taken by the angels. By the angels. Yes. All right. I'm glad that came up so I can really explain that in detail. Okay. So there, there is a time like before the, the death of Christ and there's a time after the death of Christ. The death, the life and death and resurrection of Christ is the great divide in terms of theology, in terms of the life of the church. So there are things that happen before that and there are things that happen after that. All right, let's talk about what happened before. What happened before Christ is that when a person dies, it seems like the angel, when a good person, a person that have accepted God and lived for him, it seems like the angel is the one who has to carry you or usher you into Abraham's bosom. Okay. That's what they did to Lazarus. And that's where you are. And the other part of Abraham's bosom, the, the other section is called Shield or Hades. Remember, we talk about Hades, Hades right? Yes. So we talk about Hades and the dead that are here. They are in torment, the ones that are in Hades. Now, when Jesus went to paradise, he emptied it. He took all those out. Let's break a little. We are saying Hades. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus went, it was not Hades, it, it was paradise. Well, how do we make okay. that distinction? There, 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 actually, there are three parts of this. Now, if you would go back to the last lesson, uh, let's call it the afterlife. Okay. Or let's call it life after death. Okay. A better term. So life after death, you go to, there are three compartments. The first compartment is paradise or Abraham's bosom is the same place. Okay. Paradise, Abraham's bosom, the same place. And then Hades is somewhere different. Hades is the part of the tormented dead. Okay, so Jesus did not go to no, Hades, he, he went to... Sometimes Pilate. the whole of that place is referred, to, referred as Hades. to as Hades. Okay. Right, uh, as Hades, or as Hades can also refer to as the grave. And, you know, Hades, it, there, that word is translated many different times in Scripture. But to be accurate is to separate the names, right? The place of torment, let give that the name Hades and keep it that way. And the other section where Lazarus went to is, let's call that paradise or Abraham's bosom. And we found out last week that paradise went to heaven. But Jesus took it. And the, re the reason why we know Jesus took paradise to heaven, when John was taken into heaven in the book of Revelation, he said, uh, you know, he's, he was taken to paradise. When, when Paul was also, when Paul was taken to heaven, in a trance, he said, I know a man, whether in the flesh or in the body, I cannot tell, who was taken up into the third heaven. And then he said also, that same man was taken up into the third heaven. He was taken to paradise. So the third heaven is called paradise. Paradise is in heaven. That's where all those who were before Christ, like Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the, the patriots of the Old Testament are in heaven, in paradise. Okay, and we are attaching... Enoch and Elijah. All, the all of all the Old Testament Moses. saints. Okay. okay. But they could not go there. They could not go to the third heaven without Christ. Okay. Because no one can go to heaven except by Christ. Even the Old Testament saints. So they killed a lamb or a bullock or a turtle dove in the Old Testament symbolizing or a type of the blood of Christ. And that really caused them to be chosen or to be selected or to be uh, to have their sins kind of covered and in that way they now had residence in paradise where they were comforted they were not tormented
but they were not in heaven. They did not go to heaven until Christ came in and preached to them and took them to heaven with him. Okay. So now all of these Old Testament saints are in heaven, taken there by Christ, and they all have their new bodies. Let us go right into heaven. All right. I want to play one, I say one last thing now. And then the Bible tells us in Revelation that Hades will be cast into the lake of fire. So not yet. In Revelation, towards the end time, after the rapture and all that time, that's when Hades is going into the lake of fire. Death and hell and Hades, they're all going into the lake of fire. So right now, those who die outside of Christ, I'm sorry to tell you that Hades is still accepting people. So you, that's why we are saying you've got to be really, really serious about your life and not go to Hades. You see? Uh, but paradise is not accepting anyone. No one is going to paradise today. Exactly. Paradise is now in heaven. Next question is paradise, paradise still in existence? Paradise is in existence in heaven. So look at paradise as the same way heaven has a city. Imagine okay. heaven as this colossal place beyond the stars of God. And there's a throne, there's a rainbow, there is a river, there is a tree of, there are trees of life, and all of these things in heaven, the 20 elders and the cherubims and the sheriff and the angels and all that. And somewhere in this big place called heaven, there is a city called heaven. And that city is coming down to the earth a little later. Somewhere else in heaven, there is this place called paradise where Lazarus was. And when Jesus took them out, he took all of them up into heaven. Now, it's quite possible that the place itself that is called paradise is not physically in heaven, but the people only. That's very possible. And I want you to think that way, that the people who were in paradise are in heaven. But it's also logical to think that if there was a place that Christ could have taken the place into heaven the same way that Hades is taken into hell and also the fact that Paul says I was taken into paradise so I can only conclude that paradise is a place in heaven a section of a place in heaven okay thank you thank you for explaining that Let's, and I'm long wanting to get into heaven right here okay. on earth. Let's talk about that part of it. We're now in heaven. Mm -hmm. We have a body, no decaying, no sin, no death, no pain, a real body. Now, if someone who, let's say, I didn't know my mother before I went to heaven. Somehow she went a different way. She went to heaven, I went to heaven. Will we be able to recognize? Because on that same thread, I would like to ask, how will, will, how will our brains work? Will we be able to remember things of the earth? Will we be able to help anybody on, on earth? Will, we be able, will there be any communication, any direct contact or non-contact with that time and people on earth. But first, help me understand if I will remember my mom if, if I didn't know her before. Those people who didn't know, how will I recognize her? You're talking about when your mom goes to heaven mom, or while they're on the earth? No, when we both go to heaven. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you, you remember now that this body is very limited. And that's one thing that I really should have mentioned today earlier. Imagine your senses. Imagine your senses. Your senses are very limited. You, uh, you cannot literally smell everything as good as you would like to. You, don't, you cannot taste everything as good as you like to as well. But imagine having a body that is completely perfect, where you can taste everything, all the flavors of the food. Imagine how enjoyable that would be. Imagine your eyes, the eyesight is so perfect, you can see everything and know everything. Your brain 
now functions at 100%. Not only does it function at 100%, it is a, it is a glorified brain. So all of our faculties are greatly enhanced, you know. So the fact that we will know each other, and the Bible does say that we will know, now we see through a glass darkly, but when that time comes, we will see clearly as we, as we, can, as we can see then, we will see Jesus as he is and know him as he is. I want to I wanna clear up one little thing that I sh should have mentioned a minute ago, and that is it has to do with the angels carrying the body of Lazarus to Hades, to paradise here. Paradise. Mm -hmm. All right. The angels carrying the body of Lazarus to paradise. And the question was asked, Pastor, do, do we go to heaven now carried by the angels? Well, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I am not saying that angels cannot do that. I'm saying that's very possible. But uh, I, I cannot give you a chapter and a verse that tells us that when we die, the angels will come and carry us to heaven as they did with Lazarus before Christ. See that? And that's the distinction. One time is before Christ and one time is after Christ. One time they're going into paradise. Another time they're going into heaven, paradise in heaven. The only verse I have for that and the only scripture I have for that, it says to, from, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Now, I've heard stories of people saying, you know, when a person... Uh, is about to die that they speak and they say man I can see the angels I can see the angels they came to, to yeah. take me to heaven and I believe that I believe that is very possible you know and I would not put that down or condemn that at all I believe that is very very possible so I'm not saying no it doesn't happen I just can't give you a chapter and a verse for it Hades mm. purgatory yeah are they the same I think purgatory is a man-made word for paradise. You see, I think that's how we get a little mix up. I think purgatory is a man-made word. So people did go to paradise in the Old Testament, as we know from Lazarus. So I think uh, folks are probably thinking that people still go there now, but there is no need. It doesn't make, it doesn't fit. The argument of congruity does not fit here uh, when we think of purgatory being a place where people still go to. Because if Jesus went to paradise, and if paradise is the same place that is referred to as purgatory, I'm just thinking that it is, but I don't, I'm not 100% sure about that one. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Pastor, it, I, I do not know where our time went. Are we, uh, or is that time off? <laughs> I just do not know where it went. It just went just as we are getting into depth of, of stuff. But I still have one question that I yeah. And it's, <clears throat> it's more of a hypothetical question. And this has to do with what's happening currently. We're looking at George Floyd, and we're looking at the officer who actually you know, causes death uh, based on what we're seeing. Let's say they both go to heaven. How would that, in terms, we're saying the officer confessed later on, George Floyd was a Christian, he accepted Christ, and it doesn't have to be George Floyd and the, and, and the officer, but anybody who has done that wrong, but then confess, they go to heaven. You're saying no hate, no, no nothing. <clears throat> yeah, think of what Jesus said. Um, that's a very good question. I'm so glad you asked it. Uh, think of what Jesus says. Jesus says in teaching the disciples in Luke Gospel and in Matthew, in teaching the disciples about forgiveness, he says, if we do not forgive, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. So I know that many of us are planning to go to heaven. We've got to really, really come to terms with the reality that we have got to forgive. That's the way we make it into heaven. That's the way we get our sins forgiven. And that's the way we make it into heaven. Hate cannot make it into heaven. Can you imagine people up in heaven hateful? <laughs> Can you imagine people burning down buildings and trying to shoot people and kill people? How is that going to survive in heaven? Can you imagine someone who is like a criminal trying to steal? Look, look, look. 
Look where the goal is. The goal is on the street. <laughs> Pick it up, put it you in can't pocket. take someone there who has <laughs> evil intentions. So listen, because we are going to be changed, because our bodies will be changed and our nature will also be changed, I think then it will be easy for us to fathom the reality of us not even worried about not forgiving. We can forgive easily because we have a new body, a new mind. We are a new person. God bless you. That's all. And I wish and I pray to God that whatever, whatever you may have in your life that you think will prevent you from going to heaven, let's make it right today. Let's make it right right now. Thank you very much, Pastor. And just before Pastor um, prays for us and dismiss this section, I just want to thank you all for listening. Your questions will be noted. And uh, next week on Tuesday, again, when we have Sunday school on a Tuesday, we will answer your question. Please tune in to us on Tuesday, same time, same place, and we will continue in heaven. And we ask Pastor to pray for us and give us that strength that we can forgive in order to get into heaven. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate the note in which we are ending. Let us forgive. Gracious God and Father, I thank you today for showing us what heaven will be like and what we will be like. I pray, God, that we will ask you today as we are doing now to cleanse us and wash us and forgive us and lord we will also forgive those who have sinned against us in one way or another and let us do all those things that are necessary to be done so that we will never miss heaven we will never miss the opportunity to have a glorious body thank you for this time we give you glory and praise and honor in jesus name amen and i also want to thank you brother Leonard, for being a great host Thank you very much. And all those who work today, You're welcome. God bless you and thank, thank you so much. Thank you all, Paul, Corey, Sister Pauline, T, and all those who worked with us this afternoon. I want to just say thank you all. Hey there, thank you for joining with us in worship wherever you are. Whether you have been saved for years or just want to know more about God, we are praying for you and we bless God for you. We go live every Sunday. Subscribe now and never miss a service. Down in the description box, you'll find the link to our website to learn more about news and events and even given online. You can follow us on all our social media platforms as well. We love you. Stay safe and God bless you.